If you have your Bible, we'll turn to uh, Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21. <clears throat> Leviticus 21, and we're going to read uh, verse 16 to 21. Verse 16 to 21. It says in Leviticus 21 and verse 16, <clears throat> you know what, before we uh, start, Brother Larry, do you mind uh, opening in prayer for us and just ask the Lord to bless our time together if you would? Yes, Lord, in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to once again abide where he is. And I'm just waiting to know how to thank you for this day, and for thank you for what you've done for us thus far. Right. And we pray that you would uh, go with Brother John at this hour as he feeds us, Lord. Give us your word, Father. Give me the right words to say, and for the right time. Not only that, but to touch each and every one's heart, each and every one's soul. Jesus Christ, let it all sink in. And could you just continue with us over here, Lord, because you know. Uh, Goings and our comings, our ends and our eyes, each and every one. Amen. Just continue to strive with us, Lord. These and all those blessings we ask to be loved Son of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, Leviticus <clears throat> chapter 21 and verse 16, and we're going to read down to verse 21. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-backed, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. Well, somebody needs to call OSHA. Because this sounds like intolerance. This sounds like 
bigotry, discrimination. How can this be that somebody can be excluded from the workplace? We need to, uh, you know, today, if you had uh, the uh, <clears throat> CPS and the Health and Human Services and uh, the ACLU and the NAACP and every organization, the, the alphabet, they would sue the Lord. Lord, you're unfair. You can't, you can't write that. You can't tell people they can't work in the... Uh, so I want to preach today on God's discrimination. God's discrimination. Why, you know, these are the types of verses that the world stumbles at. They look at these things and they say, the Bible doesn't make sense. You know, God's not fair. Now, let's look, before we even, here's something important to remember. If you can hold your hand there, we're, we're going to look at why this is in there. You know, I won't leave you hanging. Lord willing, before we go, you're going to know 100% why the Lord said that. And it's going to make total sense. And you're going to be on God's side. <laughs> Believe it or not. But let's look at verse um, uh, Isaiah 45, verse 9. And if you can hold your hand in Leviticus 21, and all of this has to do with the gospel. The reason the Lord said that about the priests has to do with Jesus Christ coming, dying on the cross, and the priesthood of the believer, which is each of us. But we're going to get into that. But Isaiah 45 and verse 9. Look at Isaiah 45, and we're going to go back to Leviticus. First of all, you know, one thing to remember is that Certainly for the Christian, okay, the, the lost, somebody that has not received Christ as their Savior, they're not going to give the Lord the benefit of the doubt. But a Christian, you remember, you better always give the Lord the benefit of the doubt. And what do I mean by that? In other words, if you read something in a scripture that doesn't make sense to you, just assume that the Lord is a little wiser than you. <laughs> he, he might know something that you don't know. And there might be something at play that you're not aware of. You know, and that's, that's our pride, isn't it? We read a text like that in Leviticus 21, and immediately everything that we've been taught as Americans, everything the society says, everything the world says, everything that the, the job, uh, the environment and atmosphere in our jobs has ingrained into us and in our education comes to bear on our minds, and we think, well, that's just not fair. The Lord shouldn't have said that. There's something wrong here. Give the Lord the benefit of the doubt. The Lord is wiser than you. When God says something, it's true, whether you understand or not. And there is a reason for it. And there is a just and holy and righteous reason for it, because that's who the Lord is. But look at Isaiah 45 and verse 9. <clears throat> it says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. You're the clay. We could go to the other verse where it says, I am the clay, thou art the potter. You know, we all know those verses, right? The Lord is the potter. The Lord is fashioning you. It says in Romans 8, 28, for, uh, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You're called according to God's purpose. And so as the potter, the Lord is fashioning you even when you try to fight, and even when you try to do the things you're going to do, eventually you will, verse 29 says, you will, Romans 8, 29, you will be conformed to the image of Christ. Why and when? At the very last, when you're with Christ. You know, if, if we, uh, the Lord, um, I believe we're close to the end of times. You know, I mean, look at how many scriptures have been fulfilled. Prophetically, Israel's back in the land. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, diversity, sorrow and trouble, all these things the Lord said in Luke 21 and Matthew 24. We're near the end. But whether we sleep with Christ and pass on to heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord, or we're here when the Lord steps out on the clouds, blows the trumpet, and we call it the rapture. You know, It's not a biblical term, but the Bible says our gathering away. When the rapture takes place and our gathering to him, you will be conformed to the image of Christ. So the potter, the Lord is the potter, and you are the clay. This verse says... Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it? Think about how ridiculous that would be. <laughs> For the potter to be working on a piece of art, working on something he's fashioning, he's got in his mind, God the potter, you know, this is a picture of God as a, the potter. He's got something in his mind that he knows what the end result's going to be, and he doesn't reveal it all to us. He doesn't tell you your whole life beforehand, does he? No, of course not. 
But think about the clay turning around to the potter and saying, why are you making me like this? That's ridiculous, isn't it? Well, that's what the verse says. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, what makest thou? Or thy work, <laughs> Lord, he hath no hands. You didn't put a handle on this jar yet. You didn't, you didn't put a lip on the edge. You didn't, you didn't put a pour spout on this thing. Or, well, that's ridiculous, isn't it? And yet, that's what we do all the time, isn't it? We, we say to the Lord, Lord, I think I could run my life better. Why'd you allow this to happen? Why'd you allow that to happen? You know, forgetting that we invited mankind, we invited sin into the world. All of these bad things that happened, the Lord didn't make Adam and Eve for those things to occur. He wanted them to live without sweat, without pain, without death, without suffering, without cancer, without car accidents, without drunk driving accidents, without all of these things. And Adam and Eve, so yes, you can sit here and say, well, I'll blame Adam and Eve. Yeah, but you've sinned too, haven't you? So if you were Adam and Eve, then you would have sinned then too in the garden. So in other words, don't blame anybody else. Don't blame Adam and Eve. Blame yourself. Hey, look, I have sinned. I have disobeyed the Lord. We invited sin into the world. And so for us to sit here and say, Lord, why did these things happen? Well, that just really is kind of silly to say, isn't it? To the potter, why are, you, why are you making me this way? And that's why it says in verse 9 at the beginning, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Now that wasn't even the sermon. That was just... Uh, a freebie. So <laughs> I just wanted you to think about as we're, we go through, though, the first thing I, I read you something provocative on purpose, right? <clears throat> Leviticus, go back to Leviticus 21, if you will. You know, what, who, whatsoever man hath a blemish or an, uh, a blind man or a lame, well, remember to give the Lord the benefit of the doubt. But let's go through and see why did the Lord put those things in there. <clears throat> Leviticus 21, and let's go to verse 1. What is the context <clears throat> of this? You know, and it's just amazing how the Lord uh, put this scripture together. You know, and you've heard those statistics of 40 authors over 1,500 years of writing on three continents, uh, different education levels. You know, you've got some who are just fishermen. You've got the most educated uh, in their time, like Paul the Apostle. You have kings and you have peasants that wrote this, and yet there's one <clears throat> cohesive story all through it. In the Old Testament, it's about Christ in mystery going to be revealed. There's a prophet coming. There's a Messiah coming. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Everything points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the New Testament, here he is. You know, I mean, just shows you that only God could have put this together. There's just no way humans could have written it and put it in such cohesion and made so much sense out of it. But you look at Leviticus 21 and verse 1. <clears throat> And it says, here's the context of what we had just read a minute ago. And the Lord said unto Moses, <clears throat> Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. And it goes down through some more, um, immediately we're going to look at this, some more restrictions and laws that the Lord gave to the priests. But I want you to take note in verse 1 that it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests. <clears throat> you are the priests. It says in Revelation, we don't have time to turn to all these, but you can write it down. Revelation 1, verse 6 says, Our God and Father, uh, our God hath made us kings and priests unto God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has made you to be a priest. You're not a king right now, clearly, right? None of us are, are reigning over anything, uh, but we have the opportunity. There's at least five crowns in the New Testament, and we've gone through those uh, just not too long ago, a few months back. But there's five crowns that the Christian can win. They're not guaranteed. You know, your salvation is all Christ's work. But your rewards in heaven and your potential crown or crowns are based on what you do after salvation. I mean, that's just common sense, right? You know, not every uh, son of a wealthy or rich uh, man or woman out in the world inherits equally, do they? The one who sticks by the, stays by the stuff, as King David said, stays by the stuff. The, the son who stays with the father and apprentices, uh, becomes an apprentice to him and learns everything and uh, helps to, to grow the business and, and loves it, and helps to his father, is going to inherit more of that business 
than the son who just left and, you know, like the prodigal son, Lord, uh, Father, give me that which is mine, and then just runs around the world living for himself and pleasure and not caring about his father's business, not caring to learn it. Well, then, of course, they're going to inherit differently. The Christians will inherit differently. You read 1 Corinthians 6, and it says that um, this list of things is given, and it says, these shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not salvation. We've talked about that without getting too, too deep in the weeds and all that. But you, you have a crown that you can win, and, you, and the Lord says in Revelation 1, 6, and it's also in Revelation 5, uh, and, you know, study the New Testament, you can reign with Christ. 2 Timothy 2 is another good one. It says, uh, verse 12 and 13, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. You will reign with Jesus Christ if you suffer now. But it says, if we deny him, he also will deny us reign. Not eternal life, because the next verse says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. You, know, you won't lose your salvation, but you won't reign either. So just pointing out that part about the kings. But right now, that's, that's future. But right now, you are priests. Do you have to go to anybody to intercede and confess? Like the Jews, they had to go to the Levitical, the, the Levite priest, the tribe of Levi. They had to go to Levi to intercede and do it, make a sacrifice on their behalf, right? The, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, all those other tribes could not go into the temple and make a sacrifice. The Lord forbade it. He said, you, you don't do it. You have to bring your sacrifice to a Levite, and that Levite, the priest, will make the sacrifice for you. But today, remember it says in... Uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator now. Jesus is called the high priest of our profession in the book of Hebrews. He's the high priest, but you are priests that can go straight to God the Father because Jesus Christ is in you, and he is the mediator between God and men. You don't have to go to any other priest. You don't have to go to a pastor. You don't have to go to anybody and say, Hey, I, I've sinned. Uh, you know, Please forgive me. Ask God to forgive me. No. We don't do that, right? You go right to God and you say, Lord, please forgive me. I've sinned. How can you do that? Because you're a priest. He hath made us to be priests, Revelation 1, 6. So I, I, I'm, I know I'm really driving that point home, but because the whole text is to priests. In other words, it's to you and to me. Uh, Leviticus 21, 1, speak unto the priests. All right, look down at verse 10. It says in verse 10, And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head nor rend his clothes. Verse 11, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 11. Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. So that's talking about actually touching, their, like preparing the, uh, the dead. You know, they, they weren't supposed to be the one to personally take the body of their loved one and uh, prepare it for burial. So they, and, and you know, think about the, uh, here's the ramification or the, uh, the, the meaning of that. The Lord says the priest is not to touch the dead. You know, as the Christians, you are now saved. You're brought, raised to newness of life, like it says in Romans 6. It says the Spirit of God you're baptized by the Spirit of God, that's how we're born again, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. So touching the dead, the sin, the, the, the flesh, the things that are wrong, is not what the Christian is supposed to be doing. And yet, often, that's what the Christian does, isn't it? We get saved and we think, wow, amen, I'm, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven. And then we go back to the, the sins of our past. And then sometimes we fall in maybe to new sins. The Lord says, don't touch the thing that is dead. Those dead works, that sin, the things of the world, the things of the flesh, stay away from them. And if the priest did right, then they had God's pleasure, God's peace, the righteousness that the Lord said the priest ought to have. If the Christian does right, and you stay away from those dead works of the flesh, you stay away from the, the dead things of the world, you stay away from sin, don't touch it, then you'll know God's smile on your life. And like we just sang, whether that means having money or not, in the New Testament, that doesn't mean having money. You know, the, those prosperity gospel preachers in the last hundred years, well, Jesus died and penniless and homeless. He said, the Son of Man, the foxes, 
have holes and the, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So was Jesus unrighteous because he didn't have uh, the prosperity gospel of these preachers in the last hundred years? And No, of course he wasn't. Paul died. Peter died. All of them died with nearly nothing. Broke in poverty, but they had Jesus Christ. They had salvation. So the prosperity now is, you know, it says in, um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. So, you know, the physical things, you're not going to be wealthy and meat and drink and houses and lands, but it says the kingdom of God is peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> so the Lord tells the priest, stay away from the dead things. And the Christian today ought to stay away from the dead works of the flesh, from sin, from the things that distract you from serving the Lord, from pursuing uh, success in the world's eyes to the exclusion of living for the Lord. I'm not saying you can't pursue success in the world's eyes. Sure, you might be successful in business and your, your finances, but is your heart right? The, the Lord has millionaires, and uh, I, I heard of this billionaire. Um, it was about 10 years ago here in Texas <clears throat> who uh, made a fortune off oil. I can't remember the guy's name. I'll have to look it up. I have his name at home. But anyway, he... he uh, he used his money and his time to continue to serve the Lord. He never lost sight of the fact that no matter how much money he had, he was a servant of the Lord. He was a bus captain, and when he went from having very little to literally over a billion dollars, he continued to be the bus captain at his church and drive this bus route and pick kids up. But now he had the ability to help the church actually buy a bus and do those things and use his, his time and his money for the Lord. You know? We talked about just the other day how maybe that's why the Lord withholds material success from a lot of Christians is because would you continue to be faithful to the Lord? Or would you be the one, you know, like the, the preacher asked uh, years ago at our church, if I gave you a million dollars today or this week, what would you do with it? And, you know, everybody starts blurting these things out. Well, I'd be on a beach in the Bahamas. Well, maybe that's why the Lord doesn't give you a million dollars. Because you wouldn't be in church on Sunday. You wouldn't be serving the Lord through the week. The Lord knows who he can trust with success. So I'm not saying that money, success in the world's eyes. I'm not saying that it's wrong to have it. But is your heart right with the Lord? And here he tells the priest to stay away from the dead things of the world, the uh, dead works of the flesh. <clears throat> and, of course, the, the literal application was there, the dead body. But it's a type. You know, hold your hand there. How do we know that these things are all a type? If you hold your hand there, uh, go to uh, Hebrews 10. You know, the, the Bible tells us, it tells us in Galatians, it tells us in Hebrews, uh, several times in the New Testament, that the things written, it says in Romans, go to Hebrews 10, if you will. But it says in Romans 15, verse 4, the things which were written aforetime were written for our learning. All of these things in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we're on the other side of both, right? Were written for our learning. Now, the Lord didn't give you an Old Testament full of these laws and restrictions and guidelines so that you could be bored as you read your Bible. He gave them to you so that you could learn. Things which were written aforetime were written for our learning. But look at Hebrews 10. <clears throat> and uh, let's see. I don't know if I wrote down the actual... Uh, <clears throat> maybe verse 1. Yeah, it is verse 1. Hebrews 10, verse 1. <clears throat> it says... For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, or not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. But see that first phrase, and the, most of the book of Hebrews is about that theme. That the Lord gave the Hebrews, it's called Hebrews, the law of Moses to point them to what Christ would do later. It wasn't just, you know, well, just some random thing. The Lord wanted them to be re religious and, you know, make sacrifices. <laughs> no, the Lord has a purpose and a plan in everything he does. But it says in Hebrews 10, 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. The Lord gave them the law to show, here's what I'm going to do in Christ. Here's what I'm going to do with the priest in the New Testament, who, who is you that will receive Jesus Christ. 
So we're, gonna, we're getting up to Leviticus 21 where we started. Uh, let's go back to Leviticus 21 <clears throat> and look at verse uh, 13. <clears throat> verse 13, <clears throat> it says, And he, the priest, Leviticus 21, 13, And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow, or divorced woman, or profane, or an harlot, these shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. Look at verse 15. Neither shall he profane his seed among his people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. So what is that saying there? Remember, here's the second part of the, the text. Jesus is the priest. So when Christ, again, you know, I, I don't have, if you read the book of Hebrews, the Lord is called our high priest several times. Uh, I don't know if I wrote, um, maybe I did. Yeah, Hebrews 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Hebrews 3, verse 1. Jesus is called the high priest of our profession. And it's capitalized. Capital H, capital P. Jesus is the high priest of our profession. So think about this. Uh, you know, I, a lot of times I'll go to a text and kind of camp on it for the whole sermon. So I know I'm having you jump around a lot today. But look at, uh, if you could hold your hand in Leviticus 21 and go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. The bride is presented to Christ as a virgin. L look at this text here. 1 Corinthians 11. You know, in these things, if you really get a hold of these things, it'll bless your heart. You know, in, in a, the true way. <laughs> you know, sometimes people <laughs> use it as an insult, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's in other words, trying to say you're, uh, you're not too bright or you're uh, touched in the head. You know, bless your heart. 1 Corinthians 11, verse, but these things will really bless you if you get a hold of these. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse, <clears throat> uh, it's right, 1 or 3, what is it? Uh, maybe I wrote down the wrong one. Was it 10? Yeah, I think I gave you the wrong text here. It might, it might have been 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> It's probably 2 Corinthians 11. Yeah, it is. Uh, sorry about that. 2 Corinthians 11. You go to uh, the next book over there. 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> and look at verse uh, verse 2. Look what Paul says, that how the Christian is presented to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So, again, back in Leviticus 21, when it says the priest has to take a virgin to wife, what is the likeness? To, to show exactly what is going to happen with Christ when he comes and the Christian is saved. You will be a perfect, chaste virgin to Christ. And then here's where the, the blessing part of that is. All, none of us were perfect before salvation. All of us had filthiness, uh, sins. You know, the Bible says even our righteousness is as filthy rags. Your, your best works are filthy rags to the Lord. You sitting there, and, and if we really examine our, our hearts, we can see why. You know, when, look how self-righteous we get when we do good works out of our own efforts. You know, it's, and, and I, before salvation, it's always your own effort. You know, so the one, the, uh, the citizen who pays their taxes and, and votes and volunteers at the soup kitchen and helps at the homeless shelter and helps clean the streets of the city and is, uh, joins the Peace Corps and does all these things, they're proud. They're proud of what they've done. Just give them a minute and they'll tell you everything they've done. Well then, is that to the Lord's glory? Is that righteousness pointing folks to the Lord? Is, are those good works doing anything for the eternal salvation of themselves or others? No. It's all just for them to stroke their ego and say, look at me, look how righteous I am, look what a good person I am, look how smart I am, look how strong I am. Our righteousness is filthy rags to the Lord. And yet, we just read 2 Corinthians 11 too, that the Lord says, you are presented as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's the power of the blood of Christ. When you get saved and the Lord applies the blood, it says in our Revelation that he has cleansed us, washed us with his blood. When you are saved and washed in the blood of Christ, all of your sin is washed away. 
The Lord says, as, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sin. And he says, I will remember it no more in Ezekiel. I mean, think about that. The Lord, we, we were sit here and sometimes we get bogged down in our own re- remembrance of sin from our past and, you know, and regret. And it, it is a real blessing. If, if you've been saved any length of time, you've had this happen. Where if you think about sin in your past that the Lord's given you victory over and you get bogged down about it and you ask the Lord to forgive you again, the, the Spirit of the Lord in you just pushes that aside. So I've already forgiven you. That's, that's already gone. And, that's, and when you sense that with the Lord and in prayer that He's already forgiven, then you know the truth of those scriptures where He says, I will remember them no more. When the Lord's forgiven it, He's forgiven it. You don't have to keep asking for forgiveness. If it's in the past and He gave you the victory, now if you keep falling into it, then yes, you need to, to Lord, help me turn my heart to you. Help me. Proverbs 28, 13 says, uh, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. You have to confess your sin and forsake it. And then when you say, Lord, that's a hard part. How do I forsake my sin? I, I can't. I'm enslaved to it. The flesh wants to keep doing it. Then, then throw yourself on the Lord's mercy. Lord, I, I can't. I'm, I'm confessing it. And yet I can't forsake it. Help, help me, Lord. I'm at your mercy. I, and, and that's when the Christian gets to where the Lord wants him. You can't even get victory over sin by yourself after salvation. You can't do anything by yourself. That's why Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. John 5. But here it says that the priest should take a wife in her virginity. And that's, that's how the Lord sees you after salvation. You're perfect. You're spotless. You're chaste. You're, you have the righteousness of God Himself because He applied Christ's righteousness to you and on your behalf. And it says in verse uh, 16 <clears throat> down to 21, we're going to quit in a minute. You know what? Before we even get there, though, look back. I wanted to point out verse 12. <clears throat> look at verse 12, Leviticus 21 12. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God. Now, neither shall he go out of the sanctuary. The sanctuary was where the Spirit of God could always be found. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God dwelt there in the sanctuary. That's why when Jesus died, and remember the veil, there's a great earthquake, and there was darkness for the space of three hours when Jesus was on the cross. And he said, it is finished. And it says, the, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. And that, that veil... Uh, it was this real thick, it, it was either like six to nine inches, I think it might have been nine inches, but it was this extremely thick veil woven that it was impossible for it to split down the middle. And no man, no men could have pulled that apart. And when that thing split, it was because that was the most holy place where God's Spirit dwelt. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil went like this and split. And the Spirit of God never dwelt in that most holy place again. Why? Because now the Spirit of God is in you. Paul said in Corinthians, what? Know ye not? Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not the temple in Jerusalem anymore. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God dwells in you. So when God left that, the, he, he symbolically told them, hey, my spirit is gone from this place, and he broke that, that veil. But think about back here, this was still in that time where God's Spirit in the Old Testament dwelt in the sanctuary, and he tells a priest, Verse 12, neither shall he go out of the sanctuary. The Lord said to the, the high priest, stay where God's spirit is. Stay where God's spirit reigns. So how does that apply to you as a priest? Well, God's spirit is in you. And it says in Ephesians, he hath sealed us with his spirit until the day of redemption. The Lord's spirit after salvation will not leave you. Thank the Lord. But you can leave where God's spirit is reigning. In other words, God's Spirit is always with you, but are you always letting the Lord reign in your heart and life? Or are you putting your God bless you, are you putting yourself on the throne of your heart and saying, I'm going to reign in my life. God, you, the, the, the Holy Spirit, you're, you're in my heart and you're in my soul and you saved me and you sealed me, but I'm going to reign. I'm going to do what I want to do. The Lord pulls you one way and tells you this is uh, the purpose I have for you. This is what I want you to do. Well, I want to do this, Lord. Then you're leaving the sanctuary. 
I mean, that's the best you can do nowadays. Thank the Lord. You can't actually leave the Spirit of God because He's in you. He's sealed in you. But the Lord gives you liberty. He doesn't force you as a robot. I will read my Bible. I will do right. I will do what the Lord wants me. I will be a missionary. I will preach. No, clearly we still have free will. So even after salvation, the Lord says, will you let me reign in your life? And some Christians say, I will not. And they leave the sanctuary. It says here in verse 12, neither shall he go out of the sanctuary. And then, you know, before we even get to the second part of that phrase there, that's where all manner of discouragement and lack of peace and terror and fear comes into the Christian's heart. We give up the peace. Think about where God's Spirit is, and He's reigning. There's total peace, total righteousness, total joy. But if you leave where God's Spirit is reigning, well, there isn't going to be peace. There isn't going to be joy. There isn't going to be righteousness. When you don't have peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost, so it says in Corinthians, peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost, then you left where God is reigning. The Lord says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. You know, when we take our care upon ourselves, we've left where God is reigning in our life. We're saying, I'm going to take the burden of care, and I'm going to take the burden of decisions. I'm going to take the burden, well, you go ahead and you do that. And you will have no peace, no joy, and no righteousness in the Holy Ghost because you left the sanctuary. And it says in verse 12, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. Now, you know, think about that one. Nor profane the sanctuary. That means don't sin in the temple. Don't do wrong things. Don't bring discredit, dishonor, and disgrace to the temple, to the sanctuary. Well, now that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Lord tells you, don't profane the sanctuary. Your body, it says in Romans, we don't have time to go to all these, but it says in Romans 12, verse 1, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Your body is to be a sacrifice to Christ. So are you doing right with your body? That's profaning the sanctuary. Or are you profaning the, the sanctuary by putting the wrong things in your body, allowing the wrong things to go into your body via your ears, your eyes, your mouth, your nose, treating yourself in a way that maybe the Lord wouldn't have you, or let's just say the Lord wouldn't have you treat yourself. Don't profane the sanctuary. The Lord ex expects you to present your body a living sacrifice. It says in Romans 12, 1, which is your reasonable service. He gave himself and sacrificed his body for us when he didn't deserve the pain, the suffering, the death, the hell that was put on him on the cross. And now the Lord says, will you present your body a living sacrifice? There's things you want to do, don't do it. There's things you want to experience, don't do it if it's not going to bring God glory, if it's not right, if it's not righteousness. And so now, thinking about all of that, when you get down to verse 16 to 21, you know, just to look at 19. Or a man that is broken-footed or broken-handed or crook-backed or a dwarf or that hath a blemish, now you can understand why the Lord says all that. Because the priest was to be perfect and the sacrifice was to be perfect. Look at um, verse uh, 21 of chapter 22. Just the next chapter over. Leviticus chapter 22. We're almost done. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 22 and verse... 21, it says, And whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Verse 22, Blind or broken or maimed or having a wen or scurvy or scab shall not offer these unto the Lord or make an offering by fire of them upon the altar uh, unto the Lord. So you see that the sacrifice is supposed to be perfect and the priest. We just read that. Why? Because Jesus Christ was perfect. He was the priest and the sacrifice. And uh, we, again, you know, Hebrews 3, 1 calls him the priest. And there's others, but just to give you one of the references. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Jesus is called our sacrifice. So the, Jesus fulfilled both of these. The priest has to be perfect without blemish. Christ was perfect. No sin. No blemish. No problems between him and God. Nothing on his conscience. He was perfect. 
And then the sacrifice has to be perfect, no blemish, or it can't be accepted by God. Jesus Christ is now the priest interceding on our behalf, and he was the sacrifice on the cross, the perfect, sinless, holy Son of God. So when we sit here and say, wow, God's discriminating. Why does he say, yeah, well, watch your attitude. <laughs> the Lord has a reason for all of these things. And, and then, you know, so remembering, too, that the Lord now looks at you as a priest and a sacrifice. And he wants you to be perfect before him as a priest and as a sacrifice, present your body. And, of course, the Lord knows we're in these bodies of flesh. And we fight the old man. Paul said in Romans 7, you're, you know, the things that I would, I do not. And the, that that I would, I, I do not. And, you know, I find that a lot. Evil is present with me. Well, the Lord knows your infirmity. But he's also looking at your heart. Do you desire to be the priest and the sacrifice he wants you to be? Or you just throw your hands up on Lord, I just can't do it. I'm just going to live how I want to live. <laughs> well, maybe that's where you are. Then ask the Lord, Lord, help me to desire to do these things. Help me to desire to love you. Help me to want to want it. <clears throat> Thank the Lord for his grace, or else we would all be hopeless. <laughs> the Lord had to be the perfect sacrifice, the perfect priest, and then he made a way for us. Did you have a uh, song picked out? 109 in your uh, blue book. We actually have two blue books. One of them looks a little newer. So if you have one that looks a little newer, that'll be the book. It's 109. 109. And if you could stand, <clears throat> let's sing a couple verses there. Page 109, let's sing uh, verse 1 and verse 3. <coughs>